There was a player who basically on the, the day they were signing the contract or the day that he was going to just sign it with a pen, there was an issue with the house which he, he thought he was agreed. He got offended and he left the pen on the paper, left the room and then signed the next day with, a, with another club. I remember that I was utterly shocked by that because I was thinking, oh, why? I rarely left my work to deadline day because I hate it. But I noticed that in England, it's a lot of deals happen on deadline day, so, which I don't understand, to be honest. I don't think that any, any club gets advantaged by it. Roberto, can you tell us who you are and what you do in your own words? Well, I'm a football agent um, and I think the distinction that has to be made usually is between the classic agent and the intermediary, which is one of those things where people struggle to understand from home. So a football agent can be a representative of a player, so represent him entirely in his negotiations and commercial and financial aspects, or can inter intermediate, which means working on behalf of an agent or a club, to bring a deal home, basically. So a club can empower me to negotiate a deal on their behalf, or an agent can call me up and ask me, can I help him out to find a club for his specific player? So there are two different aspects of the job. So which of those would you say dominates most of your workload? The player I would say 50%. Uh, I would say that intermediated various deals. I think that after my Sunderland experience as director of football, it's, uh, it was a convenient situation. To be honest, I'm happy about it. So uh, a lot of Italian clubs thought that I could be useful in uh, selling and buying players here and uh, vice versa, Premier League clubs, you know. So I would say both. Both, I would say. No, no distinction. How did you become a football agent? I finished university and then I started working like everybody for an agent. You know, I was really the, how do you call it, the bag boy, we say in Italy, you know, just uh, trying to listen to everything that was, uh, you know, trying to perceive and uh, everything that was uh, going around uh, football and transfer, etc. So I'm very proud of it for my, of my path because I started really from the bottom and I worked my way up, you know, and I've actually, I, I've learned a lot by doing also this kind of uh, path and also the mistakes which, which went with it. Which players do you represent and have you represented? Well, I represented, uh, I would say I'm very proud of my career because I represented World Cup winners, Champions League winners and Serie A winners, Premier League winners and so I represent several players in various countries from Premier League to Serie A or to Finland actually also. So it uh, doesn't really matter the proveniency of the player for me as long as that player that I like to take care of is, is fine. Do you look for particular traits in a player? as someone you'd like to work with or are there other key things that you look for? Mm. I think that a player has to, I have to go along with the player. So it's very difficult for me to, since you know the, the, the role of the agent is a, a difference with the intermediary is a 24 seven job. So you have to follow the player in his, um, his daily life, you know, and is every week in, week out when he plays, when he doesn't play. And I think that from that agency point of view, it has to be a player which I get along with, you know, uh, which we have a human aspect, we, we, we build a trustworthy relationship with. And sometimes it doesn't work with everybody, you know, sometimes everybody's a different person, right? So I think that that's a, that's a part that I look a lot into representing a player. And sometimes actually I, did, I decided not to do so because I noticed that we didn't get along in the basic stuff, you know, and it's very difficult then to think in a long-term relationship, how, how can it unfold better than what it looks like. We are in the middle of the January transfer window. Yeah. Um, what is that like Make from a normal perspective? normal questions, please. <laughs> <laughs> what is that like from a perspective of an agent? It's a very different transfer window than the summer one. Uh, the summer one is longer. Uh, there's much more time to prepare uh, a negotiation uh, also because there's also the pre-season in the middle which usually keeps keeps everything a little bit on hold for a while and um, the January one is uh, is totally different because it's uh, you're putting a patch to the mistakes of the summer basically you know you're thinking that we could improve here we could improve there and especially teams which are fighting for you know retention of category or going to the European Cups and it's in one month not on three so it's absolutely different, it's much more stressful, more confused because even the poor sport directors get bombarded all the time by agents of offering players of any kind, of any, any kind of a financial situation. So yeah, it's very, very different. When it comes to deadline day itself, in, in this country, it it's almost seems like transfer deadline day in the UK is absolutely crazy and it's an event in mm. itself. Yeah. 
coming from. You even, you even have the color for this line there, yellow, it's, which is uh, yeah, it's, very peculiar. Where I come from in Italy, nobody really cares about this, but it's really cool. That's what I was going to ask yeah. you. Coming from another country in Europe, what's the perception of the way the UK handles deadline day amongst other countries? It's actually, it's a good question. It's actually very different. For example, I, I rarely left my work to deadline day because I hate it. I mean, it's very stressful and, and especially everything can happen deadline day. So deals can work out or collapse in the last, in the last hour. So I, I, I'm, I, I'm very reluctant to leave all my work done to, to that day. But I noticed that in England, it's a lot of deals happen on deadline day, so, which I don't understand, to be honest. I don't think that any, any club gets advantaged by it. And it's... Uh, you could probably do the deal before. Maybe clubs think that they can put it the last day spending less, which actually doesn't really happen. You do spend always more usually. So it's very, very different, you know, than between country and country, I guess. Would your advice be to get your business done early? I do. I try always to do my business, especially players who get very, very stressed on deadline day. So I actually try to do it much, much before. Usually I'm able to do it at least 24 hours before deadline day. You're the focus of a new Sky documentary, Deadline Day, as well, which kind of puts the spotlight on you as opposed to yeah. oh the God. players. On so. me, I will help also on my colleagues, not only on me. <laughs> so how, how have you found being that? Um, and also with like the work of, say, someone like Mino Raiola, for instance, a super agent who's yeah. he's become a personality in football himself. Yeah. How have you found that spotlight being put on you? Well, I was saying to, to your colleagues that the first time I received the email regarding the, this documentary, I thought it was a prank from my friends because I was thinking, why on earth should they take an agent to do, to do a documentary? It had, had no sense for me. Then, of course, I went deeper in the email. It was too sophisticated for being a prank. And it was, I, just, I just was very clear with the production that I wanted to show who really I was, you know, without any gimmicks, without any uh, theater, without showing something else, because I wanted to depict the agent in a way how it really is, which is hard work. You know, everybody thinks that we're a category which doesn't, which wakes up late in the morning, has fun, uh, money pours in, uh, and uh, fantastic lifestyle, you know, and everybody, every young kid wants to be an agent because they think everybody's going to become a multimillionaire. And it's not exactly so. There's a lot of hardship, a lot of hard work behind it, you know, a lot of dedication, a lot of stress, uh, a lot of burden also sometimes. So, yeah, that's, I, I just was very specific that if you want to follow me in my negotiations, that also I wanted to come out. You know, I wanted to come out also, not also when I'm doing the deal, but what it takes even to do the deal, all the stress, and even sometimes when I'm very tired about it. Do you think it's been really necessary to give a voice to the agent at a time where we always hear from players and we always see them on social media. We always hear from clubs and we see like the Sunderland Till I Die documentary going, given a club's perspective. The agent hasn't really had a voice or been allowed to give their perspective on what they do until arguably now. Do you, so do you think it's long overdue that an agent has been given a voice? Well, I don't know if it's um, necessary, to be honest. Uh, I think that it was curious, so that's why when I received this uh, request, I was uh, a little bit reluctant but, and curious to see what, what are they looking for, because if they want to show the agents, you know, showing off their, their watches or cars and everything, that's what I, I told them, I'm not going to do that, you know, that's, there's nothing to do with my work, that's just an imaginary of what people want to see or think they are, and that's not what agents, I mean, what not kind of agent I am. So I was very um, I don't know, say adamant on what I wanted to show in the documentary and they followed through. I guess, I haven't seen the documentary yet, so I don't know if they did a hatchet job or anything. So, but that's, that's at least what I tried to do when, I, when they followed me in my negotiations. What aspects of your job do you feel people don't see enough of in terms of, from a football fan's perspective, we see an agent simply brokering a transfer and then we see the end product is a yeah. multi-million pound transfer. What don't we see behind the scenes that goes on? Well, I think you said it yourself, you see the end product. You don't see what happens, which means there can be months of negotiations with the same clubs or with other clubs or players who initially change idea, then want to go, then want to stay, then change again idea, or clubs who maybe at a certain point they think that the negotiations are going too slow, they change their target, they start negotiating someone else, so you have to push more on your side to make the deal happen. So there's a lot of, I always use the word stress, but it is a very stressful job also because you are taking care of other people's careers and other people's lives and you have to do it with the highest responsibility as possible. 
I think, you know, I mean, when you sign a contract with a player, in this case, is a, it's a trustworthy relationship, you know, and he puts, he's basically putting your, his career in your, in your hands. So there's a lot of things behind the scenes, and I hope the documentary is, is able to catch it. Could you talk us through the process of a big money transfer and how that actually gets over the line? What do you mean? How, how would you be involved in brokering a transfer from, say, the initial interest yeah. to getting it confirmed well, over the line? It, well, it depends on if you're an agent or if you're an intermediary on the site, you know. So sometimes when you're intermediary, uh, you get, as I said, empowered by a club or an agent. And I can't say that you're witnessing it, but you are involved. The last decision as an intermediary is not the my client because he's not my client you know so it's the clubs or the agent or the player and then the other player in that, in, in that case so um, I think that sometimes the intermediary job is a little bit more less less stressful I would say uh, because anyway you know you, I've been empowered and if it doesn't happen well you know I, I try to do my job at best but what can I do instead when you're taking care of an agent it's uh, it's a little bit different you know because he's your client so you're much more involved I think not only financially but also emotionally so, as I said, it, it's, it's a long process, you know, and uh, regarding the financial side, I mean, it's up to the clubs actually decide how much a player can cost. I mean, I, I would say that uh, between players, the stress related, if it's a League One player or is a top uh, Premier League player and transfer, the behaviour of the player is always the same, you know, if, if they want to leave or they want to stay, they, there's no actually difference of how they feel if they're a one million pound player or they're a hundred million pound player. They want to always improve their, their career financially and technically. Could you tell us about some of the transfers that you've been involved in? Well, oh, which ones? <laughs> I mean, what, what do you want to hear? What, what is the... Maybe some of the biggest money ones, the, the most lucrative transfer deals. Well, I don't know if they're the most interesting ones. I think that there are, there are other funny ones. I mean, I remember that my first year of career when I was working for an agent, I was in my late 20s, I was under shock because um, uh, there was a player who basically on the, the day they were signing the contract or the day that he was going to just sign it with a pen, there was an issue with the house which he, he thought he was agreed. He got offended and he left the pen on the paper, left the room and then signed the next day with, the, with another club. I remember that I was utterly shocked by that because I was thinking, oh, why, what, what's going on, you know, but then you start to learn things or differences, you know, and uh, or another transfer which uh, there was a little bit of nervousness because it was a European player transferring to Premier League, and I can tell you it was Manolo Gabbiadini, and, uh, and there was a lot of mixture between uh, euros and pounds, gross and net per week, per month, taxes, not taxes paid, and it's a radically different situation between Serie A and Premier League. So that was a deadline transfer which we thought we were going to do in two hours, it took like ten. And we, we were really close in missing it, you know, but then luckily went, it went well, yeah. What would you say is the, are the biggest misconceptions that people have about you and, and your role? Yeah, I think the misconception is that it's, it's an easy work, you know, I think that a lot of kids especially, or young, uh, young guns, how you want to call them, you know, then they look at TV, we're bombarded by football 24-7, you know, on, not only on TV, on social media, on everything, especially the new generation is, uh, I would say, a victim, a little bit of this misconception. And, uh, you know, they look at all these transfers in, uh, and the billions and uh, they think, oh, I want to be an agent also because unfortunately in England, the rule is that it's enough for you to pay uh, 500 pounds to register yourself as an agent and they think, I'm an agent now. So now I can sign multi-million dollar <laughs> players. It doesn't really, it doesn't really work like that, you know. And, and of course, I think another misconception is that we're talking about Premier League players usually or big level players, but there's a lot of categories. There's Championship League, One League, Two, National League, like in every country of the world, right? So we're talking about that we see just the 1% of the big transfers, but the 99% of the players, they, you know, they work their... I can't say the, right, the bad word, they work their A off, you know, to, to try to improve their career and everything, but it's, uh, sometimes it stagnates also in lower categories, you know, so that's what also these, uh, the misconception is that all the agents who work are, oof, wow, always at the top, and at the end of the day it's not like that, because mostly I would say that between these top leagues we're just 40, 50 agents, which we, and we all know each other, uh, which, which, which keep working at the level. So just imagine the, how low the percentage is respect to the number of agents really existing. One final question on, on that sort of fee, 
Football fans always complain about the amount of money in football and how extortionate transfer fees seem to be these days. Okay. But is it just the result of market forces leading to, say, a £100 million transfer because football is by far the most popular sport globally. Yeah. People are always paying to watch it. There's so many sponsors of players. It's only in, is it only inevitable that a transfer costs that much? Yeah, well, this, this is also, as I told you before, it depends what, what transfers you're looking for, because there are also players who earn 30,000 a year and not 30,000 a week, you know? So in that case, what is them? How come they never speak about the, uh, the money monster behind this uh, situation? So um, I think, it dep I mean, the FIFA has established uh, the rules, you know? Actually, new rules are going to come out now, I think, on the 19th, on um, that... Uh, Agents will be entitled to a little bit less than they were, they were used to. So I'm, I'm an agent who's always followed basically the FIFA rules, so I get paid on the base of what is allowed. Then, of course, it depends always on the negotiations of the player, you know, when a player, which is, if a player has a lot of offers, you have leverage. And, uh, and sometimes the families are involved, you know, so, and the families want, of course, to benefit from also the career of their, of their son in this case. And I don't find nothing bad about it, to be honest. So uh, when you read these figures, first of all, you have to read if they're true, if they're not, you know, there's a lot of money, which uh, for me is, uh, seems a little bit strange when I, when, when I read it, to be honest, because sometimes it doesn't have a logic. Then, of course, if you're buying, uh, trying to buy Mbappé and you're the agent of Mbappé and his family takes care of him also, it's up to negotiations, right? I mean, nobody's putting the gun against chairmen to buy players or sell players. It happens, so it means that that amount was considered sufficient and enough to make the deal happen.